So obviously, yeah, Nick, thanks for that. Just spoke us through all the different type of people that we might be dealing with and, you know, how everyone's um, going to be different and deal with this change differently. But the key theme throughout was engagement, uh, making sure, you know, the, how, how critical it is that our end users are engaged. Um, and we've seen from experience how easy it is to kind of fall into the trap where we, uh, a business might over-invest in tech and then under-invest in the sort of training and the change side. So I thought it might just be worth just spending just a little bit of time talking a bit more about why it's so important. There's a few points on here. I'll just very briefly elaborate on each of them. But um, engaged, unit, engaged users are actually more you know, adaptable to change. And we all know that ERP implementations are complex and they're, they're ongoing as well. So more often than not, you've not just got the initial lift uh, to cut over to your new system and changing processes, but then you've got that continuous um, constant cycle of updates, reviews, process changes. So ensuring your users are engaged early and constantly throughout the project helps to kind of build their muscle that will be needed for your new landscape of, of continuous change with their new ERP system. And then on the flip side, you'll find that users are less resistant to change as well. So uh, we spend a bit more time later um, talking about the typical fears that end users will experience during ERP implementations and sort of how we might go about reducing this. But ultimately, these fears and anxieties can result in resistance to the change and the update of the new systems. So this can be a real problem for businesses trying to sort of, you know, cut over to a new system and plan significant change. If your people aren't on board and they're resistant, then you're not going very far. So it's another sort of key point. Um, it's a fact that engaged users are more receptive to training programs. It's just simple, you know, engagement enhances the learning experience and ultimately, you know, it makes users more confident and they're more likely to become proficient in the system. So it's really important from a training perspective as well. In terms of productivity, engaged users are more likely to utilise the full range of features and functionalities offered by the system. Uh, so that again, they get that sense of confidence. They're more likely to use these new capabilities to streamline processes. Um, and so then from a business perspective, ultimately, you're more likely to see a return on your investment and realisation of the goals um, because people are actually using this new functionality. And then finally, from um, the final point is about ownership and commitment. So by engaging your users, you are more likely to um, sort of instill this sense of ownership and, co and commitment to the actual success of the system that you're trying to implement. Um, because when users feel involved in the process, they're more likely to be committed to making it work, um, both in the short term and the long term. And so the implementation kind of needs to be something that's done with them rather than something that's done to them. They need to be involved. And again, we spend a bit more time talking about that later on. But that's just just a few of the reasons about why it's so critical to make sure that our end users are engaged. Yeah, brilliant. Thanks, Shelley. So, Nick, um, we're talking about three points here. Um, you know, what sort of role does communication play in that engagement piece? And, uh, you know, can you can you elaborate on that for us? Oh, you're on mute, Nick. Sorry about that. Um, so, yeah, sorry, Tony. Um, so communication. So. When we talk about um, communication, you know, one of the things you often hear is, you know, you need the the right message at the right time to the to the right people, yeah, um, and also via the right channel. And and yes, that is um, very very important. And and you know, we often see a lot of work going into planning of communications, and we have a strategy for communications, and we have a plan. I think um, the key for me though is um, communication needs to be um have have outcomes that you want to achieve from it yeah and you need to be able to adapt it otherwise you know you can have a plan in place on day one and you complete those lists of tasks by the go live date and beyond and you say i've done my job well actually i think you know one of the things we need to consider and about the types is what is it that you um what is it that you want to hear people say as a result of receiving a communication yeah and so when you if you really want to connect with the users, you need to think in your mind, okay, when I when they receive this message, what they're going to say, if they're going to say, um, well, I don't believe it, then you've got to think about the messaging around that. You think, well, yeah, 
OK, good to know, but I didn't need to know that. And it's about the timing of the message. So I think you need to think about that. So measuring the effectiveness of, of communications is as a, important as actually delivering it and mm -hmm. being able to adapt to that and listen. So quite often, I think the key thing is around having those focus groups, using those, uh, if you have a champions network, really to help them shape your communications is going to be key. Because we know how to do it. But to, to hit the nail on the head, we need to listen to those users as well. So have you got any kind of specific examples, Nick, where, you know, sort of effective user engagement has positively influenced uh, ERP projects that you've been involved in? Mm, so just just general engagement of the users and early sort of engagement. So yeah. um, is that what you mean? So, um, I think I think definitely yeah. So um, yeah, you you need to understand people's motivations and you need to understand what it's like for them in their day jobs because the ERP yeah. for a lot of people is not going to be the whole of their day job. It's you know it's a tool, it's an enabler for the work they do as an operation. So I will say uh, uh, you know a few years ago I uh, worked on a, an ERP program that over fifty thousand impacted users. It's a long program. Um, and uh, I will actually tell you it's an emergency services, right? So mm -hmm. a very, very different operational sort of situation. And I think um, we 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 early on we took the we took the opportunity to spend time with them as an op with uh, with users with, with potential users. This is a long day down the line, but we got to understand what their what their jobs were like. You know how they interacted with technology. Um, you know, how often they were actually in an office and things like mm. that, because yeah. by doing that and starting to understand, you know, how um, their lives worked day to day, we were able then to really shape things um, that were going to come further down the line around focus communications and training. And I think actually, as well as helping with our planning, um, you know, that that uh, user engagement early also um, made them feel a part of the change as well. Yeah, we became standing uh, sort of agenda items on their fortnightly meetings. Yeah, and it wasn't, uh, you know, they they saw us as part and themselves as part of our team to go through this change. So I think that also was a a really good way. So we understood how they worked. We understood what was going to work for them in terms of preparing for the change and also post change. And also we were seen more of as a partnership. So I think that was a as a good example of actually don't don't underestimate the value of getting close to your users early so just before we um, move on to Shelley um, I see there is a question from um, Rita uh, who's asking uh, what modes of communication in your opinion has worked best I mean it varies from business to business obviously and you know there's no one rule that fits every organization but um, you know I know that we've had examples of Nick where we've worked together and you know we've had um, really effective uh, town halls that have had CEOs involved as part of that you know as part of that communicative piece and you know getting that senior stakeholder engagement has been really powerful um, you know but uh, any other examples of uh, of what other forms of communication have worked well for in your experience? Um, well I, I think it's difficult to say that there's obviously a lot of new digital channels as well and I think they can be good in certain situations but again I think you need to be able to measure the success of it for that particular context or that that organization I mm -hmm. think um, you know I, I, you know one, one of the to the other way around the flip side is one of the worst things you can do is assume that a well-worded email is going to solve all your problems right and that's unfortunately <laughs> what what some people believe is uh is the result but you know things like um particularly um uh you know focus groups are very good yeah because i will say you know communication is not a one-way thing it's a two-way street and the focus mm -hmm. groups um do help you to uh, communicate, get points across, and also immediately assess the effectiveness or the, you know, how people are going to react to those communications as well. Um, so I think I think where where it's possible, I would do those and do them frequently with small groups and different pockets. I think that's a you know a really really effective way to do it. I know it's not possible in all situations, but um, that would be one one tactic I would use, it, you know, to to improve it. Right. 
So, Shelley, in terms of training, um, mm. you know, how pivotal is that in terms of the, the role of user engagement? Yeah, well, I mean, actually, just coming back from the communication bit, just before I move on to point number three, I, you know, it's, it's it's all intertwined here, isn't it? The, the communication side, you know, also has a massive impact on the potential for success in the training sessions that we have as well. You know, it, it's all it's all related. I, I mean, I've been in a situation in my early L&D career where I was drafted in quite specifically to deliver some training to a, a team with some new system skills based on a change in their role. Uh, and it turned out the first time they'd really understood the additional tasks and changes to their roles when I had arrived there in their training session to deliver and train out the new skills. Now, you can imagine that given that this is the, the, the first time they've been told and that was by me, you know, you can imagine that actually the rest of my system training then was, you know, it wasn't as effective as it could be. You know, um, mm. they just felt distracted, frustrated, you know, and so yeah. this communication element is absolutely vital as well to get everyone in the right mindset uh, and give people time to prepare and ask questions and process information before we get to the training section um, and our allocated time to focus on the system because, um, if we're talking about the other things, you know, all of that should be dealt with in advance. So when we're getting to systems training, um, everyone's clear on that side of it. And we can focus on what we want to focus on in that session, which is the, the learning new system skills. So it's it's all interrelated. And, you know, from a training team perspective, we're also quite keen to be as actively involved in that communication side um, as much as we can, really. So, you know, why wait until we're in a, a classroom or doing an end user training to actually talk to them and show them the system? Um, why not do it early on and go for a, a drip feed approach you know where in the the time in running up to training we start holding I don't like setting the scene type sessions where we can introduce the system and show it how it looks and how it feels mm. um, and then try and you can, in these sessions we can start to actually unpick the impact it's going to have on users and then that's given them the time and the space but you know by introducing these things and these changes earlier we're giving them the visibility and the space to actually process some of these changes probably challenge some of the changes as well which is fair enough but you know it gives them the space to do all that before we get onto the systems training so i um, just thought it was worth pointing out um but in terms of point number three tony the quality training side um you'll have to rein me in a bit i'm conscious of time and i could talk about That's this for okay, a very long worry. time i've, <laughs> but, got, I've um, got time under check you're good okay yeah um i think it's it's worth pointing out here that, that there's two elements there's two words here quality training right and delivering one doesn't necessarily deliver the other so um i think it's worth pulling apart and kind of you know from a basic perspective for training you know we know that if we want anybody to take up new system skills, they've got to have some sort of training. So the basic things you've got to do is, you know, you've got to get the timing right, making sure, you know, you're not delivering too early um, so people forget or too late. And so it's a big rush at the end or even worse, you lose your training slot out due to other business priorities. So the timing is important. The who is a big one. You know, who is it that needs training? Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, it's it's vital to ensure that, you know, in terms of engagement, you know, you need to be training the people who are going to be completing these new system skills, but also there might be training needed for people who are overseeing those people, you know, managers or people impacted by those processes. So all of that detail is fleshed out in a very sort of thorough training needs analysis. So that's vital to kind of understanding who needs the training, but also what, you know, it's really important if we're talking engagement that the training that people attending are relevant and bespoke to them. There is nothing worse than sitting in a training session and spending time away from your day job uh, when you're very busy learning about processes that you don't complete anyway. That's the, the exact mm -hmm. uh, perfect way to disengage everybody very quickly. So that's really, really key. Um, and then obviously in terms of location, uh, you've got lots of different options in terms of location about where you want might want training to be completed. And there's different factors to account for. Obviously there's engagement, but then there's um, sort of more practical things we need to consider about logistics and the people, the type of people that we're training. Uh, and it might be that you take a bit of a blended approach. It might be maybe that for some sort of specialist areas, specialist functions who are office-based, maybe a finance team or something, the best way to engage those learners is to have dedicated classroom training. But Maybe if your workforce is global or sort of dispersed quite widely, um, then actually um, maybe people need some sort of self-service functionality training. Then actually the alternatives to these can be um, 
you know, things like e-learning, using simulations, online training, etc. And then when these are done right, these can also be very engaging, but they need to be done in the right way. And that's probably a mm-hmm. whole separate webinar. So I won't go there. But um, but yeah, so that's the, the basic bit, the, you know, the, the, the training bit. But in terms of the quality, um, that's the key bit. You know, if you can deliver quality training, that's the difference between having uh, engaged users adopting the system and using it and not. So, um, you know, for it really to deliver quality and make a difference, it, it needs to be hands on. You know, users need to have a practice at these new skills that they're doing uh, to become mm-hmm. familiar and confident in the system. So yeah. that means you need to have your environments inv- available. You need to have your data set up with activities all prepped, your user roles all defined and set up. So all these things need to be set up, ready to enable somebody to have a proper go at what they need to practice. Um, yeah. Also, in terms of quality, you need to have your business processes defined documented uh, and included within the training as well so the most successful training won't just cover the system but actually the business context the full end-to-end so people really understand that whole process you're not just showing them a little bit of a system and then and then they left guessing the rest of it you know they need to understand all the interactions with third-party systems or off-system processes to really kind of understand that 